mixed venous and arterial ulcers and how I take care of them. Um, I think this is an important topic. Dr. Meyer uh, um, um, addressed this. Uh, and during the talk, I'm going to phone a friend. These two people taught me quite a bit uh, almost a decade and a half ago now when I was uh, training in Cleveland Clinic. So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask them a few questions like phone a friend. So the garden variety venous ulcers that we're taught about, if we are taught about, uh, is that painless um, ulceration along the medial malleolus. Uh, uh, this is uh, some, someone uh, who had uh, uh, a moyodin uh, a filter that you know, occluded and eventually ended up with post-thrombotic syndrome like this. But this is the classic gator area with lipidromatosclerosis, hemosiderin, generally painless and, you know, maybe uh, diffusely uh, 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 hyperpigmented as well. But there are painful venous ulcers without any underlying peripheral artery disease. And this is important because I've seen in my practice where that focal anterior tibial stenosis was uh, uh, angioplasty because they came in with these ulcers that are uh, painful. Uh, these are called the atrophy blanche ulcers, which are um, the very superficial atrophied areas with blanching of the skin, which is pale discoloration in the middle of the hyperpigmented area with these punctate areas of uh, hyperpigmentation, which is called the atrophy blanche. So these are painful venous ulcerations in the interest of time. I'm not going to go into the much details, but know that there are painful venous ulcerations, and some of these venous ulcerations are a lot more painful than critical limb ischemia ulcerations. Um, there could be also lividoid vasculopathy underlying, uh, combined with venous insufficiency and lipidomatosclerosis, which is a form of vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis, that may need disease-modifying agents and corticosteroids and that kind of treatment, too. So it's very important, again, to think about all of those things and not just go after um, uh, a, uh, an angioplasty or, uh, or a reperfusion, uh, as uh, Terry uh, alluded to. You have seen my uh, disclosures. I'm uh, blamed to be an interventionalist, although I'm not an in, not, not a interventionalist, because uh, I am very aggressive in getting the patients the entire care, including intervention, but not when it's inappropriate, uh, that bothers me. So when you see these type of patients uh, and you see just focal stenosis, focal occlusion in one of the tibial vessels, that's not it. I've seen this in social media all the time. Um, so here is an example of a, a garden variety combined arterial venous ulceration, which is here is a 72-year-old usual uh, PAD risk factors and comes in, has a history of long SFA stent from the groin to the popliteal area that is now occluded on duplex, and he comes into the clinic um, with uh, a painful ulceration and also noted to have some reflux in the GSV reflux. And I'm putting the maximum diameter as 0.8 centimeters because I might want to use it as a, 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 as a bypass uh, for my vascular surgeon. Uh, and the vascular surgeon needs to know that if the stent is reoccluded. So this was earlier on in my career, and uh, uh, this is how the, uh, how the ulcer looked when, that, when I saw the patient for my senior partner who was lecturing in Japan that week, and the patient refused to be seen or stented or revascularized by anyone else, and he wanted to come next week when uh, my senior partner returned from Japan, and this is how it looked. So within one week. So this is how bad these ulcerations can get. So just remember that they can be very, very, very aggressive. Um, so why is it so important? Because you have, for venous ulcers and edema, you need to have that compression, Dr. Meyer talked about, and then that needs to be balanced with the skin uh, perfusion and ischemia. Um, so let's talk, let's go back backwards and see, um, you know, what the natural history and what the prevalence is. The arterial and venous disease coexistence is thought to be up to 20% of all the lower extremity ulcerations from an old study in 1991. And where did this, you know, you all probably have heard of, you know, not applying compression therapy if the ABI is less than 0.8. 
Well, you know, I had to dig around, and the first uh, paper that actually set this tone for 0.8 ABI is actually a nursing study that was published in 1986, where they looked at all the wound, uh, um, uh, lower extremity wounds, and they noted that 22% of the mixed arterial venous ulcers with ABI w w that were non-healing had an ABI of 0.62. So they recommended that an ABI of 0.7 five uh, as a cutoff which would decrease the healing dramatically. So since then on this point eight got caught on. The uh, Gloucestershire group which has uh, done the Evra trial, the, um, the Eshgar trial and all these wound trials in arterial and venous disease published a paper a few years after that and what they did is they basically took a small group of patients with ABI of less than 0.5 and ABI of greater than 0.85. And if they had point greater than 0.85, they didn't modify compression. If they failed compression, and they went on to the angiography group. And in the severe arterial group, they went down straight to the angiography group. They divided these groups, uh, the, the, the total number of patients, into three groups, ABI of greater than 0.85, ABI greater than, uh, less than 0.85, and then ABI of less than 0.5. As you can see, at uh, 36 weeks, the group three, which is you know uh, the uh, ABI less than 0.5, almost at 24 months, uh, at 24 weeks, you can see almost 100% of these ulcers were unhealed, were non-healed, and about 20% were not healed even at the 48 uh, mark. And you can see that at 48 week. Group two and group one, meaning ABIs of greater than 0.85 and 0.8, um, were quite similar. So what are the other risk factors that um, uh, affect the healing in uh, arterial and uh, venous ulcerations? This is the Peter Schneider uh, and Treman group. Uh, they looked at several patients. Their key uh, point here was whether the graft, the surgical graft, was patent or occluded. And if there was a DVT in those patients' history or not. When they looked at uh, those two factors and they treated the patients who had uh, normal patent graft with bypass surgery and uh, with saphen additional bypass surgery and saphenous stripping, um, they noted significant improvement in their wound care, 68% healed and 78% healed, while patients who had arterial graft occlusion no one healed, and patients with history of DVT also did not heal uh, significantly compared to the other group. Um, so they came up with a conclusion that if you have an arterial graft occlusion or a history of DVT, your, your venous ulcers are probably not going to heal. Okay, the more contemporary in 2007, the same group again, Poskett, you know, from uh, the Gloucestershire group, uh, they did a six-year follow-up study in UK, and here they looked at ABIs greater than 0.85, ABIs less than 0.5, and somewhere in between. What they did is 0.85, they treated with multi-layered compression wraps, um, and anyone who had less than 0.5 the severe PAD group in that uh, paper underwent immediate revascularization, and anyone with moderate PAD basically uh, had uh, conservative treatment and then followed by revascularization if not healed. So what did they find? They found um, that um, the PAD, severe PAD patients had 53% healing at 36 weeks compared to moderate PAD that were treated with modified compression therapy and intervention only if needed, and patients who had no peripheral disease, again, were treated with just compression therapy. Again, severe PAD. So the most important part of this paper, in my mind, was the 30-day mortality was 6.5%. Uh, so these patients with combined arterial venous disease are probably a lot more sicker than just the CLI patients, too. So that's another important thing to remember. So what about other options in these patients other than just revascularization? The arterial flow device, I'm sure uh, several of you have heard about this. Again, um, uh, this has a specific type of pneumatic compression 
uh, distal and proximal in sequence, and it basically increases the nitric oxide also at the microvascular level without going into uh, significant details. Small studies, unfortunately, are published, and um, there are no large studies on uh, pneumatic compression devices. Uh, they're not covered by insurance, generally takes a peer-to-peer uh, um, phone call to get these approved, but what it in these small studies have shown is that the uh, pneumatic compression uh, devices improve claudication distance, improve wound healing, decreases amputation, um, could be used in no option patients and could be used as an adjunct as well. Pentoxifilin also has been um, uh, known to improve wound healing, whether compared to placebo or compression. So I routinely use uh, pentoxifilin uh, in my severe uh, uh, non-healing or recalcitrant venous ulcers. What, what about you all? Do you use pentoxifilin too? Cool. Yes. So, so this is my algorithm. This is what I do. If it's a mixed etiology, I start with the ABI duplex and the venous reflux test. Now, ABIs, I should say PVRs, if the ABIs slash PVRs look normal, then they go through the two-layered to four-layered compression wraps, depending on how, the, how much the seepage is. Go with the wound care, skin grafts, artificial if you need, be, need to, and then do thermal ablation or foam ablation or phlebectomy, depending on what is needed for that particular vein. Once the ulcer is healed, the ulcers need to be prevented by graduated compression socks and potentially uh, with pentoxifilin. Now, if it's severe PAD, go straight to the revascularization, and if no option, then you do the same things that you did here, uh, plus arterial flow device or vein pump or lymphedema pump, close monitoring. If it's moderate PAD with, P, with, P, with uh, ABIs and PVRs, I gently apply compression wraps. I don't know what the panel does, and I'd like to get your input and also educate the family that if it starts hurting, cut it off, take it off, and then see them very frequently every week, make sure that they're improving, and also get them revascularized if it's not going as planned or if they don't have an option. Once revascularized, again, they go into moderate PAD group or normal ABI group and then follow the algorithm that way. So final pearls, be aggressive with revascularization when needed, uh, when you know that it is what it's causing. Spare the saphenous vein. Now this is another uh, thing the vascular surgeons in the audience will agree with me that there will not be a bypass with the number of vein ablations that are done. Um, and in in my practice, I take a very careful history, even in, even in patients who don't have CLI, if they have significant PAD, I will try my best to spare that saphenous vein because as long as it's a certain diameter, uh, 0.8 centimeter, 0.8 centimeters or 0.7 centimeters, it could still be a good graft, even if it's refluxing. Think outside the box. Uh, there are multiple compression methods. You could modify compression. Here is a tuba grip with ACE wrap that resulted in healing of a combined ulceration. Do least harm because these are very fragile patients. Collaborate if you're not comfortable. Uh, we saw uh, you know, our podiatry uh, colleagues who we, we always collaborate and I learn so much from them. And also finally, you know, it's not always about look how great my angiogram looks on social media for who, you, who are on social media. Please share your suboptimal results too because it's not just that angioplasty that takes care of the wounds. Uh, with that, I'll end. Thank you.